All right, Master Gardener trainee, this is part four of pruning. Hopefully you've enjoyed the first three modules thus far. All right, we're going to talk about pruning palms for, for the remainder of our, the modules. And uh, palms are not trees per se. They don't have true woody growth. Uh, they do have a lot of fibers. That gives them strength and uh, rigidity and wind and all that stuff. But they don't have those uh, co branch collars. They don't have included bark and all those other problems of the die cots. So in some ways, palm pruning is a lot simpler. That doesn't mean there are do's and don'ts, however. So when to prune a palm? O only remove dead fronds or leaves. As you can see in the upper right hand photograph, those that are hanging down in all brown are okay to remove. In the lower picture, a lot of people ask what's wrong with that palm. Those are the flowers uh, of the palm. It's a flowering, flowering plant. Those can be removed so you don't have to worry about it dropping a lot of seeds and becoming necessarily weedy around the base of the plant. So it's okay to remove that if uh, you choose to do so. However, the bees really do love those flowers. So if you're into pollination gardens and things like that, I'd probably wait till those flowers are done pollinating to remove them. So at least the bees can enjoy the goodness of the flowers, both the pollen and the nectar. Never cut a green frond. This is a very important concept. Let's look at the lower left-hand photograph of a date palm, Phoenix Spa. Doesn't matter which Phoenix, it's Phoenix Spa, some sort of date palm. This is the way a normal date palm should look, a very full head of fronds. Notice it has probably a hundred or so fronds, maybe even more, I didn't count them. But again, I usually see them pruned to like the lower right-hand picture where there's only 10 or 15 or so fronds left. That poor plant is starting to slowly starve to death because it's being over pruned over the course of time. What we like to tell people is to never remove the fronds above nine and three. One of these years I'll have to explain this uh, concept because these are like hands on a clock. Most of us grew up with a digital clock and don't understand this concept. So nine and three is don't remove those leaves above the horizontal plane if you want to put it that way. Hurricane cuts are a no-no. Uh, that I don't know what the people were thinking in that left-hand photograph. Hopefully they didn't pay a quote professional to perform such a job. Notice the palm trunk near the base and all the way up and as, as you get to the last maybe 10 or so feet do you see it getting narrower and narrower and narrower to right below uh, where you can see where the leaves were attached or the fronds were attached very very narrow we call that pencil pointing this tree is getting narrower and narrower because the trunk won't grow in diameter it were you know unlike a die cot but what happens is it gets narrower because it can't produce the food and have a thick um, heart at the time of production and uh, as a result that is the area most likely where it's going to snap should we get a wind name wind event the one on the right is a pineapple palm, another phoenix spa of some sort. Doesn't really matter which phoenix spa, but a lot of people call it a pineapple palm. As a result, they try to prune it to resemble a pineapple. Pineapples should look like pineapples. Palms should look like palms. That poor plant will probably be dead in a matter of a short amount of time, maybe another year or so.
Improper pruning. Here are some palms here. Sorry about the animation. I thought I got rid of most of it. And uh, look at the picture on the left. That is a good head of uh, leaves on this cabbage palm, our state tree, parenthetically a tree. As we know, these are monocots. As a result, palms are more closely related to your turf grass than they are oak trees. But that's how a normal cabbage palm should look. And you can see, kind of in the middle where it's been shadowed out, you can see what's been removed by some tree trimming service. Probably not an arborist. And you look at the right-hand photograph, this is what you drive around and see most of our uh, palm trees looking like. And because this is becoming more and more common, again, this will fall under what I call the monkey see, monkey do principle. So people who come here from another part of the world or another part of the country where palms are not typically grown, uh, they think this is the right way to prune it. And then they'll request that all the leaves that are anything but uh, perfectly green be removed so they don't have to look at it because they see it time and time again being done this way. Just because it's done this way doesn't mean make it right. Let's go back to think about crepe murders. So here's a 9 to 3 as I was mentioning, kind of the hands on a clock and uh, yeah a couple of those on the left hand picture could have been removed I would have left them on they look pretty uh, green and healthy to me maybe there's some yelling we just can't see because of the sunlight and the camera angle but again you could remove them if you needed to but I don't see any need in that left hand picture for any pruning however it got its yearly or annual pruning to this uh, handful of fronds left this poor plant will eventually succumb to something because of this Notice the pencil pointing that's beginning to occur on this particular plant. Yeah, that's probably where it's going to snap off in a windstorm. Here is another... Uh, pineapple palm or date palm, a phoenix species of some sort. And here it was put into some subdivision. It was okay at first, but then it got over pruned for a while and you can kind of see it narrowing right below where the brown leaves are starting to dangle down. Can you see it narrowing there? That's the beginning of that pencil pointing. And this plant is uh, starting to look pretty poorly, actually, and you probably are wondering why. Is it a disease? Kind of looks like it could be a disease, but what happened is this plant was transplanted over pruned for a while, and it became very um, stressed, and it became a magnet for palmetto weevil, a type of insect that feeds on the heart of certain palm species, primarily cabbage and uh, phoenix or date palm species. It's a weevil. Uh, you can see in the lower right-hand photograph uh, the yellow and black there, sometimes red and black weevils as well. It has a snout uh, delineating it from a beetle. But as an immature insect, it looks like a grub. Remember, beetles and weevils have complete metamorphosis. I've mentioned that in another module, and you will learn more about this in our entomology uh, section of Master Gardener training. What happens is a lot of people will see that their palms have these deficiencies or yellowing fronds. On the left hand side it's a potassium deficiency. On the right hand side it's magnesium deficiency. Magnesium is supplied by what common product? Do you remember? Epsom salt is the correct answer. Potassium would be supplemented with potassium fertilizations. Um, but palms have very specific nutritional needs, which we'll talk about when we talk in more detail in this course about palms and cycads. So what do most people do when they see these yellowing fronds? They start removing them. Think of these yellowing fronds as your savings account. And yes, you can dip into your savings account from time to time and be okay. But if you dip into it too much, you've robbed yourself or robbed Peter to pay Paul. Remember, these, both of these nutrients in this case are mobile in the plant. I talked about that in plant nutrition. In other words, the plant can move potassium and magnesium from the oldest fronds or leaves and move it upward to the newest growing, uh, to the newest growing leaves. So it's mobile in the plant. So this is uh, its reserve system. 
Now let's look at the picture on the left. There's only one or two more green fronds left on this poor, I think it's a queen palm, but I may be wrong. It is a pinnate leaf formed palm. That's all I can tell right now. Hard to speciate some of this stuff via a photograph, even for me. But the point I'm trying to make is this poor palm on the left probably is on very much borrowed time because I'm sure as I'm reading this to you or talking about this to you actually I'm sure a homeowner or professional quote quote will remove those in short order and leave only one frond or two left to try to do the job where there should be about 20 or 30 depending on the particular palm species I have the feeling this palm has been long dead since this photograph has been taken I can't stress this enough. Never cut a frond that is green. Only one is completely dead. You can see the lower left-hand photograph. That poor um, date palm, Phoenix Spa of some sort, has been over pruned. And it is well above that horizontal plane or 9 and 3 on a clock. You should know that important concept or be able to draw it should you be asked in a question. Let's look at the right-hand photograph. This is fairly normal to see deficiency symptoms in our phoenix or date palms here throughout central florida again what's likely to happen is a tree trimming service will come in and remove many of those lower fronds which are still doing quite a bit of work and are very important for the plant but people don't like the look so they'll have 30 or 40 of those lower leaves removed leaving only uh, 10 or 15 to remain that's like being on a crash diet think what's going to happen to that heart it's going to get smaller it's going to wither, it's going to pencil point, eventually it's going to snap off at some point in time. And here it was, sure enough, as I predicted, somebody came in with the, with the crew and they removed all but the green fronds remaining. And now it's kind of barely at maybe our 9 and 3, but again, you can almost see a bit of narrowing near where the green leaves are forming and just below that. Can you kind of see where it's narrowing a little bit? One big problem we're seeing with palms are several new uh, serious and usually fatal palm diseases, which we'll talk about when we talk about palms and cycads in a later module. But again, pruning equipment is probably spreading many of these diseases around in a community. Think of how we do pruning in some of these communities. You hire a company and they'll prune all the palms on, on a handful of days down the boulevard or in the common areas of your particular development that we're talking about. Again, dirty pruning equipment, if it is infected with a disease causing organism, bacterial, bacterial or fungal, and you move to the next plant, will cause it to possibly infect the uninfected plant. Again, we'll talk more about the minutia about the diseases at a later module. But this is true of any kind of pruning, whether it's on palms or, for that matter, dicot trees. We recommend disinfecting pruning equipment between trees at the minimum. There are some nurseries I've seen that do it with every pruning cut they do on, a, on the same tree. That's rare to see that in a nursery, but I have seen it done on high-end nursery-grown trees. You can use various different things to disinfect pruning equipment, whether it's chainsaws or what. You could use a Lysol-type product out of a spray can. Uh, that's pretty uh, effective, and what's nice about it is the can won't tip over and leak all over but generally it has a lot of alcohol and some other uh, chemicals in there. Be careful of, of its flammability. Chlorine bleach is an excellent disinfectant, but I don't typically recommend using it on metal printing equipment. It causes it to corrode or rust all but immediately. But it is a powerful uh, oxidizer or disinfectant. Ethanol or isopropyl alcohol, um, a lot of times that tips out of the bottle and makes a mess. You can put it in a spray bottle uh, makes it less likely to be a mess. However, it's highly flammable. I usually do not recommend it on gas-powered equipment. Trisodium phosphate. It is a cleaning agent usually found at the hardware store. And yes, this may be something you've used uh, to prep paint surface or maybe used it in uh, as part of a detergent solution to clean off greasy things like a driveway stain or a, a stain in your garage floor. It's very corrosive. Um, it's much like bleach. It'll cause your pruning equipment to start to oxidize or rust. 
also keep it off of the skin. It's uh, very highly alkaline, so it's kind of similar in pH to lye. Be very careful with the trisodium-based disinfection solutions. High concentrations of pine oil, you know it as pine salt and some other trademark names, usually has to be a minimum of 25% concentration of pine oil. That's fairly high. There are some industrial products available. Uh, they're quaternary ammonium compounds, or quats, as they are called. I also will call these sometimes hospital-type disinfectants. I like these products because they're fairly stable over a long period of time and temperature. And what's good about it is they're water-based and generally don't cause any of the corrosive effects of uh, ble bleach or trisodium phosphate. Also, they're fairly easy to, to store and mix, and uh, they're, they're really quite good. A little hard to find, but uh, you can find it sometimes in the cleaning supply uh, section of a very good hardware store. As a side note, we see a lot of our trees just being volcano mulched or mulch piled against the stem for reasons unknown to me. I'm not sure where this practice started, but it needs to stop. Um, it, this is an aside note to pruning, but again, uh, think of this like a wet bandage against, bandage against your skin. Leave that wet bandage, bandage against your stem for a couple of days and then peel it back. What does your skin look like? Yeah, icky. Well, think about that damp, wet mulch against the trunk of a tree for days and weeks, months, or a couple of years. Eventually, that will probably cause a disease-causing organism to get into the trunk and then become a big problem. Now, people will ask us many times, who do you recommend to prune plants, whether it's palms, trees, shrubs, or what? Generally speaking, arborists will not prune shrubs, but trees and palms they usually will. We recommend to look for a certified arborist. They can contact what is called the International Society of Arboriculture. Sometimes we shorthand it as ISA. Lots of acronyms in extension, a lot of alphabet soup. They're out of Illinois, but they have a list of certified arborists. You can go to their website, treesaregood.com. From there, you can click on Hire an Arborist and put in your zip code, and it'll pop up a list of those folks who have been certified by the International Society of Arboriculture. Again, they should people should do their homework on the arborist that they're hiring. Some of these companies may have the arborist do an inspection of the plant, but may not be the same person who's doing the pruning of the plant. Ask a lot of questions. Ask a couple of trap questions if you wish. Ask them about what do you think about topping this particular plant or removing all but a couple of fronds. If he agrees to it, it's probably not the right person to hire for the job. Another thing that's important in hiring anybody, an arborist, you should have proof of insurance because if this person doesn't have proof of liability insurance and someone gets hurt, uh, on your property, you, the homeowner, are on the hook for potential liable damages. As I mentioned, avoid any company that would even advertise topping as one of their services. A few years ago, when you can still get the yellow pages delivered to your home, I used to look through it just for laughs and giggles for arborists and tree trimmers, and there were a couple in Hernando County that advertised topping as a service, much to my surprise. Other pruning tips. These are important concepts that will probably come back to haunt you in future on a quiz or a final examination. Trees should not be pruned at transplanting. I didn't talk about that in any other modules. Uh, a lot of people used to cut off bits of the top of the plant to reduce the loss of, of water for dicot trees. Um, we don't recommend that on dicots. Now on some palm species we'll remove all but one frond or all of them in some cases like on the cabbage palms. reason why we remove all the fronds on a cabbage palm is once we cut the roots on a cabbage palm all the roots die completely. So the plant is basically a large cutting in the environment and has to re-root. Meanwhile if all those leaves were retained it would simply dehydrate before that process could occur. 
if you have to do any pruning, it would be way best to start doing it about a year or so after it's well established. Remember, pruning paint, wound dressing, guck as I like to call it, whatever, mud, uh, something rubbed out, uh, you know, rubbed on it, uh, chalk, you name it, some concoction on the internet, a homemade spray solution. None of that is proven in research to do anything but waste your time, money, and effort, and in some cases potentially in introduce uh, disease-causing organisms. Think about grabbing a handful of mud and rubbing it on a cut wound for you. That's probably the last thing you want to do. What about rinsing it with water? I would save the water. So, in review, young trees can withstand more pruning. That's also true of shrubs. Young plants can withstand up to about a third of their uh, foliage removed. This isn't talking about palms, but dicots. Mature trees, up to about 20% per year. Again, they're talking dicots. No flush cuts. Remember, that has been verboten since somewhere in the middle 1970s. Meanwhile, you don't want to leave stubs. That'll potentially become a source for uh, fungi or bacteria causing organisms to colonize that stub and possibly get past the area that the tree sealed. Prune back to a branch collar or bud if a branch collar exists on that particular plant. Don't cut into the branch collar because you're also cutting into trunk tissue as well. No topping or heading cuts on mature trees. Again, topping and heading stimulates additional growth that you probably do not want. Most of that new growth would be weakly attached, high over your head or high over a house or parking lot or wherever. That could become a hazard in, in the course of time. Several pruning cuts over two or three or four or five years are far less severe or uh, harmful to a plant than doing it all at once. Kind of like I mentioned in pruning shrubs when they get overgrown most people just whack them right back to the ground and restart the process anew and expect a different result at the end of the end of the season or so. Small cuts have less negative impact on a tree. Again I started pruning is what is pruning. I said pruning is wounding but it can also stimulate growth. Try to avoid removing lower branches on young trees. I really didn't talk about that in the modules till now, but if you're wanting to make a nice thick trunk, which is strong to the wind, leaving lower branches on or even cutting them back by half will aid in thickening that trunk quicker. A lot of people over prune and lift up the canopy and these young trees to form a lollipop on a stick. Usually those trees are very weak after a short amount of time. Develop a pruning plan when trees are young. Again, when do we teach our children please and thank you? We don't wait 18 or 20 years into their development. We start them right away from the beginning. But for reasons unknown to me, we don't start training our trees until after their past teenager or their past young adulthood. And usually we don't start doing it till well, their middle age and beyond. Or for that matter, they may be on the downward spiral and now we want to try to fix it all and we're just going to probably cause more harm than good. So develop the pruning plan when trees are young. Trees grow fast in the state of Florida. I think this person kind of didn't want to do it till right now that there's a problem. This will conclude pruning. I hope you enjoyed all the modules. I'll be seeing you in class shortly and actually in person.